My name is Phyllis Auric. In this Dickens to Go, I want to highlight some passages from the old curiosity shop's 15th number for what they show us of Dickens's complicated attitudes towards religious belief. Surprising to me, he has now invoked with affection John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress, the monumental allegory that, short of the Bible, stood and still stands as the epochal story of evangelical Christianity. But Dickens is not content to stop there. He uses his descriptive powers to paint a metaphysical creative force in nature, but it falls short of godliness, and he ends his flirtation with religion with a sardonic swipe at evangelicals who raise money from the desperately poor to build chapels that will tell them of the perils of earthly existence and the promise of heavenly rewards. I also chose these passages because Dickens professed to be very pleased with how they were turning out. Number 15, which I began today, I anticipate great things from, he writes to his dear friend John Forster in June 1840, about three weeks before it appeared in print. There is a description of getting gradually out of town, he continues, and passing through neighborhoods of distinct and various characters, with which, if I had read it as anybody else's writing, I think I should have been very much struck. The child and the old man are on their journey, of course, and the subject is a pretty one. It's interesting that Dickens would say it was a pretty subject, as the chapter starts with Nell's fretting that she might lose her resolve to set out if she has to say farewell to Kit in person. And in the book, he describes it as a wild journey, more in keeping with the misadventures of the Bunyan pilgrimage. Indeed, they set out from the Babel of London, whose smoky skies and invading army of brick and mortar resemble Bunyan's city of destruction, from which his pilgrim, the Christian, sets out. The parallel would be clear to most of his readers, as they would know of the Pilgrim's Progress, even if they had not actually read it. And Dickens is said to have admired it for its power as, as a fiction. As Nell and her grandfather set out to escape the destructive city, Dickens wraps them in a celestial atmosphere. The town, he writes, was glad with morning light. Places that had shown ugly and distrustful all night long now wore a smile and sparkling sunbeams, dancing on chamber windows and twinkling through blind and curtain before sleepers' eyes, shed light even into dreams and chased away the shadows of the night. Birds in hot rooms, covered up close and dark, felt it was morning. The cat forgot her duty to hunt mice and wanted only to bask outside. The light, creation's mind was everywhere and all things owned its power, Dickens wrote. There could be such a power, Dickens is saying, but it does not own the world, rather just the opposite, all things own it. And for the first time, he makes a little rep literal reference to a pilgrimage. The two pilgrims often pressed each other's hands or exchanging a smile or cheerful look, pursued their way in silence. They travel on and eventually reach a hill suggested of this celestial hill from which the traveler turning to look back at where he has come from can see Bunyan's city of destruction or London and might feel at last that he was clear of London. Old St. Paul's looming through the smoke, its cross peeping above the cloud, if the day were clear, and glittering in the sun, and casting his eyes upon the babel out of which it grew until he traced it down to the furthest outposts of the invading army of bricks and mortar, whose station lay for the present nearly at his feet. And here Nell is reminded of the pilgrim's progress as she and her grandfather sit in their pretty spot. There had been an old copy of Pilgrim's Progress with strange plates upon a shelf at home, over which she had often poured whole evenings, wondering whether it was true in every word, and where those distant countries with the curious names might be. As she looked back upon the place they had left, one part of it came strongly on her mind. Dear Grandfather, she said, only that this place is prettier and a great deal better than the real one, if that in the book is like it. I feel as if we were both Christians, the name of Bunyan's pilgrim, and laid down on the grass all the cares and troubles we brought with us never to take them up again. So that is the first stop, the pious heavenly one, now for Dickens's take on such thinking. Again this quarter past, they came upon a straggling neighborhood where the main houses parceled off in rooms and windows patched with rags and paper told of the populous poverty that sheltered there. Like here is squalid and faded gentility is making a last feeble stand with shipwrecked means. These are the humble followers of the camp of wealth, 
living on the outskirts of London. Another meaning for camp followers is prostitutes. These people seeking their fortune are selling themselves. Dickens paints a detailed picture of the cost of such a basement. Damp, rotten houses, children, scantily fed and clothes spread out over every street and sprawling in the dust, scolding mothers stamping their slipshod feet with noisy threats upon the pavement, shabby fathers hurrying with dispirited looks, mangling women, washerwomen, cobblers, tailors, chandlers, driving their trades in parlors and kitchens and back rooms and garrets, gardens paled with staves of old casks or timber pillaged from houses burnt down and blackened and blistered by the flames, mounds of dockweed needles, coarse grass, and oyster shells heaped in rank confusion. He caps his litany of, litany of misery with a sardonic dig at, the organ, at organized religion. Small dissenting chapels to teach, with no lack of illustration, the miseries of earth and plenty of new churches, erected with a little superfluous wealth to show the way to heaven. The impulse behind the church is built with a little super, superfluous wealth is cynical, since those doing the building are taking money from the poor to teach them what they already know, the miseries of life on earth, and to promise them something just as cynically presented, the way to heaven. In these passages, Dickens has, as usual, taken his readers on a journey. As he put it in the opening of the final chapter, chapter of the old curiosity shop, after Nell has died, and her grandfather has followed her literally into the grave. The magic reel, which rolling on before, has led the chronicler this far, now slackens in its pace and stops. It lies before the goal. The pursuit is at an end. In his version of the pilgrimage, Dickens starts his readers off with a celestial piety's bunion, but diverts them from that path and leads them to the land of desperation and poverty the human condition that he observed so closely and wrote about so well. Thank you for listening. <laughs>